this is super uncomfortable for me. I've intentionally not talked about how much I make as a self-taught software engineer. And I believe this is probably the first time that I'm even gonna say where I work. The reason 98% of new software developers are not getting job offers is because they are not doing these 11 things. How is it possible for an average construction worker to learn to code, to get that super hard first programming job and then get hired by a large tech company making hundreds of thousands of dollars in total compensation each year. Nine years ago, I was totally that construction worker because I couldn't get another job with my near worthless history degree. So I ended up freezing my butt off in the cold each winter doing physical labor for mediocre pay and no benefits. I'm now a full-time senior front-end software engineer at Adobe and I'm self-taught working in a nice cozy office. So let's talk about why most self-taught devs fail. Why you should choose to become a front-end developer instead of learning Java, PHP, Python, or some other back-end focused programming language. The technologies you should learn, the right way to learn to code, and how to get your first job as a programmer. What's the matter with your mind and your sign and uh, but first, What's your background story? I would totally dig it if you'd let me know in the comments. Fist bump. All right, there are four main reasons most people fail when they want to become a self-taught programmer. First, they underestimate how hard it's going to be. There are plenty of videos out there about people who are learning to code in three months, six months, and in my case, it took around nine months, though three to six months is probably not very common unless you end up in a full-time boot camp that can really help you stay focused. I did it in nine months in the evenings with the support and patience of my wife and kids because I end up having to sacrifice pretty much every evening during that time. And that's not gonna be something that's going to be doable for a lot of people. It took a ton of self-discipline on my part, especially on the days where I just wanted to give up because there will be those days. You also have to be realistic about your ability to learn quickly. Some people learn incredibly fast and things just stick. Others need more time to process it. If you compare your progress to a fast learner, you're gonna get discouraged and may quit even if you're actually learning code at a normal pace. Second, for most people, getting your first programming job is going to suck. I'll share some good strategies to overcome this in a minute, but a lot of people wash out before getting that first job. Third, some people's brains just aren't wired for this kind of work. I know plenty of people who are amazing working with their hands, and that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. If you think that's you, before you give up, I encourage you to question yourself. Is it really because you don't have the brain for it, or is it just because it's hard and you lack grit? Fourth, a lot of people make poor decisions when it comes to picking a programming language or area of software development. So let's talk about why I chose to become a front-end web developer. And in simple terms, front-end web development is just the visual part of a web page or application that you interact with. There are a couple of really important reasons why I chose this. First, I have nothing against backend development. It's super important. This is where the magic happens for storing and retrieving data. But let's face it, backend code is visually boring. And this means when you go into interview, the only thing they have to test you on are code problems and your ability to communicate what you know verbally. You're new, so you might understand what you're doing, but it's super easy to get stuck trying to explain things and just not using the right words to describe it and to get hung up. At least that's how it was for me when I first started. Perhaps that's hard for you too right now. But the cool thing about front-end development is that you can show the finished project. Even if you stumble on describing some of the things, they can see what you have done. If you have other valuable skills like an eye for aesthetics or good user experience intuition, it will show through in your work. Second, the front end includes everything from software engineering skills to design skills. And so it tends to be more open to self-taught developers as a community. It's a pretty big mix of different backgrounds, whereas with backend development, you can tend to have a higher concentration of computer science grads. Now, it's still gonna take a lot of hard work, but it's gonna be easier to stand out and outskill other self-taught front-end web developers who maybe just don't have the same level of ambition as you do. Third, on the front end, there are plenty of tools to make it super easy to set up boilerplate code needed for an application. And that lets you quickly jump into developing everyday code skills without getting lost doing all of the complex configuration stuff you can learn all of that later. For a lot of people, being able to see visual changes happening on the page can be super exciting. It's awesome to get fast feedback on the progress you're making, and this really helped me stay motivated. With backend, there are also tools to set things up, but the basic stuff can be pretty boring, and it's just so much harder to impress people with what you have done. It's like walking in the shadows of your girlfriend's real boyfriend. And this is really important when talking to non-technical hiring managers or recruiters, because even these people can appreciate 
a website or an app that looks nice, even if they don't know what's going on underneath the hood, especially websites where you can hit that like button. I would totally appreciate that. So, oops. but you are going to end up having to learn three things. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. HTML is kind of like code Legos that gives your app structure. The CSS or cascading style sheets lets you define the size, the shape, color, the animations for each of those Legos. At JavaScript is how we give it instructions. If someone clicks on a button, what should happen? Maybe it loads some data onto the page. If you hear someone say vanilla JavaScript, they're talking about writing code with plain JavaScript without using any third-party libraries or frameworks. And as software engineers, we do a lot of repetitive stuff. And instead of writing everything from scratch ourselves, smart devs will usually use libraries of heavily tested code written by other people. You should probably ignore anyone who says you should only use vanilla JavaScript or else you'll end up basically building your own crappy library that nobody else knows how to use. And if you care about actually getting a job, most companies will want you to have experience working with one of the major JavaScript frameworks like React, or you could learn Angular if you want to become a boomer living in your mother-in-law's basement. The right way to learn to code is not reading a book cover to cover. It's not trying to understand everything. There's just way too much stuff in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that you just won't use. It's far better to master the core concepts and to learn all that other stuff as you need it at some other time instead of just becoming mediocre in everything. The best way to figure this out is to just step away from following tutorials as soon as you're comfortable with the basics and just start building things to that solve problems that you are already interested in. As you write code, you'll start to identify things that you just keep doing over and over again. And you should focus on learning how to do those things really well. How can you make that code chunk smaller, more reusable, maybe more efficient and easier to read? that kind of stuff. And then you should be able to explain why you chose to do it the way you did. In your interview, you'll probably get asked questions that stump you or that are just hard to remember the exact answer. If you understand generally what's going on, it's gonna be super easy for you to say, I don't remember that one thing and then just start to explain everything else. And that's probably one of the best tips for dealing with your first interview. In fact, that is exactly what happened during the interview that led to my first job offer. Being able to talk about a lot of core concepts can really make up for messing up on some random technical question. And trust me, I messed up on a few questions. And here are some more tips for how to get your first job as a programmer. First, most people who are fast at getting their first dev job either know someone at the company or they have someone mentoring them who can vouch for them and their skills or else they just got lucky. And if you want to be that person, try to build solid relationships with people in the industry as soon as possible. Second, if you've made it this far, I assume you are liking this video. So consider subscribing. I have a ton of other videos to help you become a programmer. Okay, for reals. Second, you are at a distinct disadvantage when compared to computer science grads. They have a paper that vouches for their educational experience, and that is something you don't. You have to get practical experience any way possible, and that means build your own projects, work for free if you have to, but you have to find creative ways to get your own experience. In my case, I built personal projects in the evening, and then in my downtime at work, I started building things and doing things for my employer that could provide them value and build some skills, stuff that they didn't even ask for. And this means I had to be proactive and come up with ideas on my own. I created my own opportunities to get experience and you're gonna have to do similar things too. Third, you wanna have a portfolio that can sell your potential. And instead of focusing all of your attention on a single large project, I would shoot for a handful of smaller projects first and then do one that is more of a complex project. The people interviewing you are probably only gonna give it a quick glance. So seeing lots of projects is going to have a bigger visual impact initially. And by starting with building the smaller ones, you're gonna get some quick wins that are going to help you stay motivated and then dive into that larger one. If you start with a really complex app, there's just a good chance that you are gonna get lost and that you might give up. For these projects, you need to do stuff that interests you rather than just copying existing projects or tutorials. Simple and unique applications are gonna be way better than a complex tutorial clone, but a unique complex project will really stand out. And don't get me wrong, I mean, following tutorials can really help you develop your skills, 
but just don't consider them to be good portfolio pieces. When you get to an interview, there's a good chance that they haven't even clicked the link to see your portfolio. So bring an iPad or a laptop and be prepared to show them what you've built and explain the technologies you used and why you did what you did. If you used multiple frameworks, tell them what you liked about each one and what you didn't like. That will go a long ways. Fourth, and one of my personal favorites is don't just sit there hoping they'll ask you the right questions. It's like politics. Instead of waiting timidly, just answer their question as best you can, and then try to steer the conversation to related topics you are prepared to discuss with confidence. Fifth, the spray and pray approach to sending out resumes just doesn't work well. If that's what you're doing, don't complain about why you're not getting interviews. You need to do whatever you can to get in contact with the hiring manager directly instead of going through HR and the online application process. You don't want to be a no name in a database. The goal is to have the company want you before you ever fill out an application. This is super uncomfortable for me. I've intentionally not talked about how much I make as a self-taught software engineer. And I believe this is probably the first time that I'm even gonna say where I work. I just haven't really wanted to come off as flexing. That's not really how I roll. Anyways, I'm giving in and making this video because I just keep getting comments like this one on becoming a front end developer. The comment is both right and wrong. And I'm just gonna try to be really transparent here and tell you how it is when it comes to front end developer pay as well as talk about some of the things that you'll need to know if you want to get paid how much you're worth and in a minute I will share with you how my pay has increased over the last eight or so years as a self-taught front-end software engineer so here's the skinny in a lot of areas front-end development is a race to the bottom I mean think about like website mills or Fiverr WordPress templates website builders like Squarespace. These are just a few of them, but they're low paying because it's just super easy for someone living in an inexpensive country where there's a really low cost of living to just come in and do just as good a job as you for a few dollars. Making simple websites for people is dying. There'll be a few people out there who want custom work and are gonna be willing to pay for it. But most of the people looking for these smaller, simpler websites are just wanting cheap websites. I mean, it's gotten so bad that it's not even worth me spending my time to build my own personal websites and I talk about that more in another video and I'll leave that link in the description below so to make a lot of money as a developer you are probably going to need to build applications but not all apps are the same without good marketing apps in the app store probably aren't going to make you much money they're kind of becoming the next race to the bottom if you're gonna make a ton of money you're really gonna need to build applications that solve complex problems now this usually means that you're gonna end up having to work at a startup or at a larger enterprise company but even then at those kind of companies, the developer salaries are going to vary from company to company. Some just don't understand the market. And then there are other companies who intentionally try to take advantage of new software engineers. You may end up having to work at some of these in order to get that initial experience, but as soon as possible, and once you have that experience, you just wanna stay away from these companies. You really wanna to try to get a job at a tech company that pays well. But even if you get in, the different areas of the company are actually going to pay differently. If you work on a project that is needed, but that doesn't really directly relate to making money, you're probably gonna get paid less. This type of project is called a cost center. However, if you end up working on a project that brings in a ton of money from customers, then you're likely gonna get paid more because you're working at what's called a profit center. Now, cost centers try to squeeze you with high expectations and low pay, but usually profit centers, they wanna keep you happy and productive. So they give you financial incentives to stay and keep working because if they lose you, then they lose that knowledge of the things that you're working on and it can actually hurt the profits that they have. To get better jobs, you have to specialize in in-demand skills. And then you have to become good at those skills and then you also have to be a good culture fit. And that's just another way of saying someone who's able to take criticism and not be an arrogant jerk. You need to be someone who will just jump in and solve problems rather than the kind of developer that has to be told everything to do. You need to be able to work independently and be an effective contributor. All right, now for the not so juicy juice. And maybe I'll even get fewer of these dumb comments going forward which is not super common because most of you leave great comments and ask awesome questions, so thank you. Let's jump back 11 years ago when I was working construction for my father's underwater construction company. I do go into how I transitioned from construction to web developer in another video, so I'm gonna keep that part short here, but I started doing web stuff part-time when I was making around $45,000 a year. And keep in mind that I do live in the United States. Now, where I live, we do have a growing tech hub, but I do not live in Silicon Valley. And so the 
salary and cost of living here is lower than it is in someplace like San Jose or New York. When I look back at the first couple of years working for my father's company when I had started doing the web development, it's kind of hard for me to say exactly how much time I was spending doing that versus doing other stuff. So usually when I say that I've been doing software engineering for eight years, I'm only counting the last year of time working for my father's company when I was heavily doing front end uh, development, building applications and marketing websites, though my experience is a little bit longer than that. I don't know if it's just me, but sometimes I feel like I got to discount those first years of experience because I was new and I was also working for my father's company. But I did end up getting some pay raises along the way but I got a decent pay bump when I got my first enterprise front-end software engineering job at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I was building applications for their missionary department and it was a contract position, so I didn't get any health benefits, but I was making around 85 or $87,000 a year. And this was a crash course in new programming frameworks, tools and complex systems, things that I just hadn't worked with when I was on my own working for my father's company. And so I ended up spending a lot of time in the evenings on my own, just learning stuff in, so that I could try to really up my skills as fast as possible. About a year later, I ended up taking a front end job at Western Governors University for $95,000. And after being there a year, I got a 3% raise. And then when the second year came around, and I was to get my yearly raise. I only got a partial raise because I actually ended up hitting the ceiling on my job salary banding. And basically what that means is that when you hit the top of your band, you can't get any more raises unless you actually get a promotion. Fortunately, I've been leading the UI development of a really important application that was gonna save the university a ton of money. And so after jumping through a bunch of stupid hoops, I was able to get that promotion and my pay was raised to $110,000. I believed in WGU's vision to make higher education more affordable for people. And so I knew I was working on something worthwhile, but by this point, I had already helped WGU make the move from Angular JS to Angular on the project that we were working on and kind of setting that pace for future migrations of older applications from Angular JS to Angular. And I was really wanting to work on projects in React. And combine that with the fact that it did leave a little bit of a sour taste in my mouth, having to jump through all those hoops for the promotion that I decided to put out my fillers and see what would happen. And I wasn't in a super huge rush because I did like what I was working on. And that's an important fact that if you want to get good offers, it really pays to be patient and not in a rush. If you're rushed, you're likely to accept an offer that's just not gonna be that good. During this time, I interviewed at four or five companies, including HireVue that I mentioned in a recent video. That was the only sucky interview of the bunch. And before that interview ended, I already knew that I just wasn't interested in working for that company. I received a couple of offers in the 120 to $130,000 range, plus startup equity. And that's basically means that you're getting shares of a company, but you aren't able to sell those unless the company actually goes public or the company is bought out by another company. And these companies were all right, but I just wasn't really feeling it. And this was really fortunate because one of them actually ended up laying off like 60% of their employees within that next year. I'm so glad that I missed that. I decided to write it out longer at WGU, but eventually I was told about an opening at Adobe. And so I interviewed there and the team was really cool and the project sounded really cool. But then I just didn't hear back from them, which was really a disappointment because Adobe was on my list of cool places to work. Two months later, my friend told me about an opening at the company he worked for, and it was an Angular position, but it seemed like a good company. So I interviewed there. I ended up getting and accepting an offer from them that was somewhere in the mid to high 120s plus equity, if I remember right. So this is where it really starts to get awkward. You see, I had accepted that offer and I put in my two week notice at WGU, and then a couple days before I was supposed to start at this other company, I ended up hearing back from Adobe and it was a good offer. And the salary was similar to the other offers that I had received, but this one also came with a sign-on bonus. And then there was the RSU grants and these are restricted stock units. So basically it's like what I talked about with getting the equity in a startup company only with the stocks that are publicly traded. Once those vest, I own them and I can immediately sell them. I do not have to wait 
for a company to go public or for a company to be bought out. So it's almost as good as cash as long as you work for the company long enough for them to vest. I felt super guilty withdrawing my acceptance from the other company, but an offer from Adobe was just too good to refuse. So that is what I accepted. And I've been there for almost three and a half years now. And I'm really glad that I was patient and waited because in addition to the good pay, Adobe has been a terrific place to work and it's fun to build cool stuff with cool peeps. Now, this may seem like a lot, but keep in mind that salaries are adjusted to where you live. So I would not be surprised if junior devs who live in San Jose or New York actually make more than I do. A couple of annual salary raises later, and I'm now in the mid hundred thousands salary wise. But when you actually include in the yearly bonus, as well as the RSUs from a solid growing company that keeps going up in value, as well as the employee stock purchase plan, that actually puts my total compensation to over $200,000 a year. I also know some software engineers with similar front end experience and similar skills who make $70,000 a year. I even interviewed at one place that considered $85,000 high to be paying a dev who has 10 to 15 years experience. Pay is really just all over the place. And despite the rat race to the bottom in some areas of front end development, overall, I think that the future is still really bright for front end developers and that the market will continue to be strong for people who are going to be working on complex applications. But where you live and the companies you work for really matter. This is everything you need to know if you want to get a good paying job as a newbie front end software developer. This is the list that I wish someone had shared with me when I first started out. And these are the same core skills that I use on a day to day basis working as a front end software engineer at Adobe. Number one, HTML. You need to understand the document object model or DOM, how to structure a basic index HTML page. Everything starts with that page, but it's blank until you actually do something and put stuff in it. For example, you got to know the common HTML tags and how to use them. This is going to include the body tag, div, image, link, order list, unordered list, list items, and there's a bunch of other elements. And you're going to need to learn about semantic HTML and why you should use it. These HTML tags provide additional meaning to the structure of your HTML. For example, section, article, header, aside, tell you more about the contents of the tag than the plain old div. With the div, you have no idea what's inside. We find and interact with tags using HTML attributes. When you see an ID, a class, data, aria, for, type, name, value, or similar words inside of an HTML tag, and it's followed by an equal sign and then something that is wrapped in quotes, you're looking at an attribute. The script tag is important because it's how we actually load JavaScript onto the page. And without JavaScript, our application or website is just going to be extremely boring and not super helpful. The link tag is going to let us include external resources in our document, like adding CSS styling. Number two, cascading style sheets, also known as CSS. It's not enough to just link CSS style sheets. We also need a way to reference specific elements in the HTML that we want to stylize. The most common way to do this is by adding class names from a style sheet onto the class attribute of an HTML element. But that's just one of the ways to do it. You need to understand why it's usually a better idea to use classes instead of IDs in CSS. And you're gonna have to prevent one style from colliding with other styles. And the way to control this is through a concept called specificity. Throwing important around all over the place is just a really bad idea. We use CSS selectors to target specific elements based on their location in the DOM in relation to other elements. For example, child, sibling, descendant, last child, attribute selectors, and there's quite a few of them out there to learn. You control the actual styling through CSS properties, which are the bread and butter of making things look good. Only it's kind of like honey butter mixed with broken seashells. Just when you start to think it's cool, you realize it's also painful. There are a ton of ways to influence the size of the elements. You can set the height, the width, there's min heights, min widths. You can do stuff with line heights. You can make stuff shrink or go completely off the page. And the spacing around all of these elements is controlled with margins and padding. But there's some gotchas here. For example, you need to know that margins can collapse. It's important to understand how these interact and affect each other and the overall size 
of the element. Do you want the header to stick to the top of the page while you scroll or have some part of your HTML take up a certain amount of space or even move it off the page? This is handled with static, relative, absolute, or fixed positioning. Flexbox and Grid are really important to know and they kind of overlap with some of the stuff that we just talked about. And these and their related properties help make layouts that can grow and shrink and that are aligned with each other right, have spacing between them, around them. There's a lot you can do with Flexbox. Before Flexbox, there were floats. It's good to know about floats because you're likely to encounter them, but it's even better if you can avoid using them. They're like fleas, you know, they're around you. You just don't know where they've bounced off to. Minimalist black and white sites can be really attractive, but sometimes you just gotta add a little bit of color and there are CSS properties for adding color to backgrounds, to text, borders, and even pseudo elements. There are also a ton of ways to style text, links, and images. You need to know how to handle when content over overflows its allowed space. What happens when content is too big for the space it's in? Do you hide it? Do you make it scrollable? Do you say to heck with pixel perfect and let it just completely run off the page and annoy the designers? If you have a bunch of stuff that's overlapping, which one should be on top? You control this with something called Z index. Now, the higher the Z index, the more likely it is to be on top. So Z index of 10,000 should just about do it. Okay, you really need to learn how to avoid this Z index race to gigantic numbers. Is your web application going to be used in a laptop browser or is it also gonna be used on your phone? Do you want your app to be responsive and change depending on the size of the screen so that a user doesn't have to fat finger tiny buttons on their phone? We use media queries to control rules for the different sizes of screens and device types. Or maybe you wanna spice up your site and have menus that slide in and slide out rather than just pop in and pop out. And there are CSS properties for doing these kind of animations. One of the challenges with updating the color of a website is that you might have to make changes to a hundred different lines of CSS just for one particular color. You can save time by storing that color in a single variable that is then used everywhere else. And then whenever you want to actually change the color, you just have to change it in that one place and everywhere else that the variable is used, it will automatically be updated with that color and will save you a ton of time. This is one of the features that are making CSS preprocessors less useful. For the longest time, that was the only way that we could do variables inside of our CSS. That said, CSS preprocessors like Less, PostCSS, SAS, Stylus are still in use by a lot of projects. Some people like how they can be nested together and there are also special things that you can do like mix-ins and other special magic. So understanding what they are and why you would want to use one instead of plain CSS can be helpful. And most of the larger projects that I've worked on have used either SAS or less. That said, I personally prefer SAS, but sometimes we have to learn to do more with less. A lot of times you aren't even going to be writing your own CSS. There are plenty of CSS libraries out there like Tailwind CSS. And in the real world with projects, there's a good chance you're either gonna end up using a third party solution to help with your CSS, or you're gonna be using one that has been built in house by the company that you're working for. Now, you can't really know ahead of time what every company is using, but it is helpful to become familiar with using CSS libraries, and you can do that by learning something like Tailwind. Number three, JavaScript. And in a minute, we're gonna talk about JavaScript frameworks and much more. But in this video, I'm not going to deep dive into the specifics of the JavaScript programming language because it's a large enough topic that I've decided I'm gonna be making a separate JavaScript roadmap video. So subscribe if you wanna know when that comes out. And a video of the courses and resources that I recommend for learning front-end development is also on the way. For now, you should plan on getting really good at JavaScript if you want to be able to get into one of the higher paying front end developer positions because it is the programming language of the front end. You're gonna to wanna to know about the newer ECMAScript features, ES6, ES7, etc. Bleeding Edge is now at 12, but the big shift to newer syntax happened several years ago with ES6. This is why I don't share a lot of the courses and things that I actually used to study when I was first learning because a lot of them are now just out of date. Number four, JavaScript frameworks and libraries. But first, I gotta throw in the libraries disclaimer because without fail, some people cannot stand generalizations and will throw a tizzy fit 
if you say you're gonna be talking about frameworks and then you mention React.js. You know who you are. You should grab a soda and go chillax. Whatever you call them, there are three main technologies to choose from for building front-end web applications. I mean, there are more, but this is what you should focus on. Angular should not be confused with the original AngularJS, which you should avoid. It's what I learned on when I was first starting out, but the newer Angular is just much better. Angular is a full-fledged framework with most every utility you could want built in. Vue.js is a lightweight progressive framework that is kind of like a smaller version of Angular. It lets you add third-party libraries as needed, and it claims to be somewhere between a library and a framework, and that's about as confusing as a girl claiming to be your girlfriend and a stepsister at the same time. The third and best option is a small library for making awesome web and native applications React rocks. What can I say? I am 100% unashamedly biased on this one, and you should be too. You see, Angular is highly opinionated, which means that there is a specific way to do most everything. So it's big and it's bloated. You wanted a banana and you got a gorilla holding the entire jungle too. On the other end of the spectrum is React, which is intentionally unopinionated. It provides some of the core functionality and you choose the rest, which makes it much more flexible. But this also means that you're gonna be learning some of the React related libraries, or you could just start with something like Create React App, Vite.js, Next.js, or one of the other similar projects as a way to get started without having to configure all of this yourself. React is in high demand, and it's what I have been using at work for the last several years at Adobe. And there's been this trend of things moving from Angular to React for quite a while now. That doesn't mean that Angular is dead. It's still a powerful framework, and a lot of people use it, most notably boomers. But there's one universal truth in software development, and that is that most everything is highly subjective. This is no exception. All joking aside, if you're a new developer, then I highly encourage you to consider going for or React, unless you already have some strong existing connections to a possible job in a company that is using Angular, then it could definitely be worth it to learn Angular in order to get that job. And let me know if you want me to make a React roadmap video. Now we have to get some data, and for that, we make API requests. To do this in a React app, you're gonna either go with JavaScript's built-in fetch API, and then build wrappers around it yourself, or you'll end up using a library like Axios that already has those utilities and wrappers baked in. I like using Axios for my projects, but I'm sure that Fetch diehards are going to chime in and tell us why Fetch is better than Axios, and we'd love to hear your thoughts. Now, if you're working with Angular, a lot of this is already built in. So it's time to make something useful. So you're going to need to interact with actual APIs. And to get started, you can build something that connects to an existing API. You probably have a YouTube account if you're watching this video. So maybe you look into creating a channel and uploading a video, and then you could use YouTube's APIs to interact with that video and the video analytics. Or if you don't wanna go there with interacting with that kind of API, then you might consider a solution like Firebase to handle the backend for you. And then that way you can connect the app to the Firebase, which is fairly easy to configure when compared to setting up a complete backend and having to deal with the database and everything else on your own. At this point, as you're either connecting to Firebase or to other APIs, you're gonna have the opportunity to learn some important things about security and protecting your data and authentication. But all of this doesn't mean that you should just go out and deep dive into backend development at this early stage in your career. And I talk more about this in another video where I share why you shouldn't become a full stack developer. Number five, component life libraries. Similar to CSS libraries, there are libraries for reusable components like buttons, drop-down menus, tables, and other cool widgets. In future projects, there's a good chance that you're going to be working with either a third-party component library or else you'll use internal ones built by your company. You might even be building components for that library. So it's a good idea to become familiar with how these work and it'll also help you to see good ways to create reusable components for when you're making your own components. Two of these that I really like is Angular Material, for Angular obviously, and for React apps, I like Semantic UI. Number six, some valuable tools that everybody should be using. In order to get this stuff all running, you're gonna end up needing to install Node.js and you're gonna need to learn how to use NPM, which is short for Node Package Manager. 
you use this to install and manage the different dependencies for your project. You also need a way to bundle your application for deployment. Now, if you're using tools like Great React App or Vue.js or Next.js, they're really gonna help with handling a lot of the more complicated configurations for you because they do this behind the scenes for setting up the dev servers and for actually bundling and building your code for production. You'll be able to go pretty far with what Create React App and Vue.js and Next.js provides out of the box, but as your project grows in complexity, you might end up actually having to learn how to configure web directly or some other bundler. In software development, it is super important to keep a history of all the changes that you've made to your code base so you can go back and see when you introduced a bug or maybe you don't like the features that you've just made and you wanna be able to roll it back without having to remember every line of code that you changed. And you also want a way to protect your code from getting lost in case something bad happens like your laptop fails. So you should learn to use Git for version control and GitHub is a great place where you can store your project that uses Git. As you work with Git, you're gonna to wanna to learn how to create repos, create branches, push and pull from repos, merge branches, fork repos, and do pull requests into repos because these are some of the things that we do almost every day and some of them we do multiple times a day. You also need to learn Chrome DevTools. It is one of the most powerful ways to debug problems with your front end application. And there are also specific extensions you can get to help with debugging React or Angular, but DevTools should be one of your best friends. Number seven, deploying code. What is the point of building an application if you don't have any place to put it? Some options for hosting your application include Heroku, GitHub Pages, Firebase, AWS, Azure, and there's a bunch more. So just pick one to learn. Heroku or GitHub Pages is a good place to start. It would also be helpful to become familiar with Docker containers and how that ties into the deployment process. Number eight, things to learn later on. Once you're comfortable with building and deploying an application, it'll be worth your time to learn how to actually test your code. For JavaScript, I recommend that you learn Jest. And if you have some time, at least become familiar with some of the other forms of tests like Selenium or Cypress. I include these in the later section because it's probably not best to get swamped learning how to test early on as you're gonna be fighting through a bunch of information overload already, but eventually you'll get to where you're actually writing tests as you're actually building features for the application. And now that you're comfortable with JavaScript, you might consider learning TypeScript. If you chose to go down the Angular path, TypeScript is already baked in, so you might already be learning it. But with React, the dev camp is still largely divided, so it's not mandatory, but it definitely could be really valuable for a lot of companies if you have TypeScript experience. Another thing to consider learning is accessibility, and you'll often see it referred to as A11Y, or some will just say Ally. And yes, those are ones and not the letter L's. Knowing how to make your application easy to use for people with disabilities is a valuable skill. I mean, imagine being colorblind and not being able to tell the difference between two options on a page, or perhaps you're blind and have to rely on a screen reader to tell you what is happening on that page. This is really important, especially at bigger companies, educational institutions, or companies that have government contracts. And now let's have a candid chat about becoming a full stack developer because it's something I get asked about all the time, which suggests that a lot of folks really don't know what it means and what's involved. And it doesn't help that a lot of job openings ask for full stack experience and a lot of coding boot camps are selling full stack programs. Let's start with clearing up some of the misunderstandings around front end, back end, and full stack development. And then we're gonna go into why you shouldn't try to become a full stack developer as someone who is trying to get into the industry. So what exactly is front end development? Well, the front end is the user interface or UI for websites, web applications, native mobile applications like those on your iOS or Android device, hybrid applications, and some front end developers even focus on creating HTML based emails for marketing campaigns. At the core, they work with HTML as the markup language, CSS as the style sheet language, and the main programming language is going to be JavaScript. Script. Now, depending on the complexity of the project, the front end is going to be integrated with a lot of different third-party libraries and frameworks to handle the different parts of the application. There are tons of them out there. You got React, Angular, Next.js, Lodash, Axios, Redux, RxJS, and there's CSS processors and a lot of other stuff. Not to mention custom in-house component libraries and style libraries. The front end then communicates with the back end to send and receive data through methods like HTTP requests and WebSockets. So then what exactly is backend development? 
The backend receives data updates from the front end UI and then updates the database. And for other types of requests, the backend returns data for the UI to display. But the backend also has a really important role to play in all this because you see actual users of an application have access to the front end code in the browser. And so we have to treat it like it's always vulnerable and always going to get compromised. The backend developers will create specific ways to send and receive data, which act as gates to protect the database from being compromised or corrupted, whether that's intentionally or accidentally. And a lot of times data is coming in from all over the place and it needs to be collected and processed into a consistent structure and cached so that the backend service doesn't have to keep doing the same stuff over and over again. You see, all of this processing costs money, so backend developers have to manage these interactions to be fast enough to provide a really good experience for the end user, but also to be cost efficient with its transactions. Backend developers often have to work across multiple programming languages, and then their APIs are usually gonna be split into microservices, where one could be written in Java, another in Scala, another in JavaScript with Node.js, or some other programming language. And then backend devs might have to integrate with a bunch of different databases, read information from data pipelines and send data through other systems. This system of interactions could be really complex. And at some companies, there's so much going on in the backend that there are gonna be software engineers who are dedicated to just databases or to managing the pipelines and others focus solely on building the microservices. All of this needs to be secure and protect the data. Now let's talk about full stack development. A full stack developer does everything that a front end and back end developer does and much more, which means knowing multiple tools for bundling code and deploying the applications because this is handled differently on the front end and on the back end. Keep in mind that a lot of job listings for full stack developers are going to be a little bit misleading and we're gonna dive into that more in just a second, but most true full stack jobs are going to be at smaller companies on tighter budgets. These companies wanna get as much out of each person as possible. So in addition to doing the stuff we just talked about, a full stack developer is probably going to do a lot of DevOps stuff like managing infrastructure and that's something that's usually going to be handled by somebody else at a larger company. A full stack developer is going to be more involved with planning, with talking to customers, and is going to be on call for anything that happens with the application from one end to the other. But that's why everybody wants them, right? Well, not exactly. So let's get into why you shouldn't become a full stack developer when you're starting out. First, most job listings cast a wide net of requirements that often don't actually match the specific needs of a particular team. For example, the job listing for my current position targets targeted full stack with a focus on front end and what the team really wanted was front end experience. In fact, 98% of what I have done at Adobe is on the front end. Now, most everyone I've worked with is also specialized on one side or the other and occasionally crosses over. We could do full stack development if needed, but we play to our strengths because that is gonna be much more efficient. Outside of those smaller companies, this separation by specialization is very common. And if you're not actually specialized and good enough at that area of need, then there's a good chance that you aren't even going to get the job offer. And this could be one of the downsides of doing a bootcamp that teaches full stack breadth without spending enough time really deep diving into the front end or into the back end when compared to self-taught devs who are going to usually be focused on learning one side or the other and learning it well. Second, back end devs are the guardians of the data, which often is the company's most valuable asset. And a lot of companies are going to be really reluctant to hire a new back end developer because because it's super easy to mess up the database. Mess ups can really cost the company a lot of money and can completely destroy their reputation. So it's gonna be harder to convince them that you're competent enough to do the job. And because you're doing full stack work, which includes backend, you're gonna inherit a lot of those concerns. Third, if the company is legitimately looking for and needing a full stack developer, they probably need someone with experience who can actually handle the entire process without much supervision and handholding. If you're new to software development, you just don't have that experience that comes from years of making mistakes that have taught you how to architect things without walking your project into a corner down the road, you'll eventually get there, but that experience is not something that you have, but it's something that the company needs right now. There's just so much to know, and you probably don't even fully know everything it is that you're supposed to know. And so they're not gonna be super interested in you unless they're new to tech and aren't even sure what they need themselves, or maybe they're cheapskates who are willing to take whatever they can get at the cheapest salary possible. Fourth, a specialist who becomes really good at some niche of software development usually makes more money than a generalist because companies that can afford to really pay well 
want someone who is really good at something. Now, money is not everything, and some people really enjoy being full stack developers, and there is nothing wrong with that. And if that is your goal, that is great. I still think you're better off becoming a T-shaped developer, and that means going deep in one area and then go broad enough to become full stack. So the path that I recommend is becoming good at front end development, just so that you can get your foot into the industry. And then in a year or two, you can start expanding your skill set to include the back end. Even if you later decide to stick with either just the back end or the front end, having that breadth across that domain and that full stack experience is going to be really helpful. And if I were starting over, the reason 98% of new software developers are not getting job offers is because they are not doing these 11 things. You're due, so there's a ton of things that you don't know and that's okay, it's perfectly normal. You're gonna make mistakes and forget things during the job interview. What is super important is that you demonstrate your confidence in your ability to figure it out. Why should we be confident that you will succeed on our team if you aren't even confident in yourself? We're probably going to ask you a bunch of questions to figure out two things. First, we wanna know what areas you're good at and bad at, because we wanna know if your good areas are a match for the skills that we are looking for. Second, we wanna know if you're a good culture fit and how you respond to tough situations. Do you get incredibly frustrated when you get stumped? Do you throw in the towel easily? Do you get confrontational? We really wanna weed out people who get upset, rude, or just plain give up on hard things because those things really hurt the morale and effectiveness of a team. For example, during my first interview for a front end position, the hiring manager spent most of the time grilling me on back end stuff and math problems. I later learned that he wanted to know how I would react in a stressful situation when I was out of my element. Also, don't talk badly about past coworkers, bosses, or projects. We can help you get up to speed learning new technologies, but it is practically impossible to teach a toxic person to not be toxic. If you trash talk them, then you're eventually going to trash talk us and nobody likes that. Number two, you really need to demonstrate that you are a good fit for our team. And to do that, you should have spent the time trying to research and figure out what it is we are looking for. And then when you get to the interview, you need to ask us early on, what we're working on and try to show that you are a fit for our needs. And here's a little secret. Our actual needs might be completely different from whatever HR put on the job listing. Half the time they don't even know what they're trying to find and so they'll just use some boilerplate requirements or they're just casting a really wide net. For example, my first job offer was for an AngularJS position and the team actually needed someone to work on a Sencha Touch application. So I ended up having to learn Sencha Touch and it was several months before I ever even touched AngularJS code. Number three, how well do you know the basics of your programming language? For example, if you're working with JavaScript, you should be comfortable with conditional logic, using objects, iterating through arrays, and there are a bunch of ways to do this functionally with map, filter, reduce, and similar methods. You can also do it non-functionally with for loops and while. Do you know how to add, remove, and replace items from arrays and strings? How to split and join strings? It is really hard predicting what algorithm problem might be asked, but it's safe to assume that you will likely be tested on some of these core concepts on a regular basis. For each algorithm question that I've received during an interview, I've been asked at least 10 to 15 core JavaScript, HTML, and CSS questions. Number four, how well do you know the basic functionality of a popular framework? For front-end development, that would include React or Angular. Can you explain how the components work? How do you pass data in and out of the components? How do you compose larger components from smaller ones? And how do you manage the application state? When would you choose to use Angular over React and why? If you're applying for backend work, why would you use Spring Boot over something else? Number five, on paper, you probably look just like a hundred other new software developer applications. How are we supposed to know you got the skills or are you just all talk? The last thing that we want to do is to hire you only to find out that you don't know anything and then have to turn around and let you go. That's a waste of both of our times and it's not very pleasant. So show, don't tell. Do you have a portfolio of projects that you've built or worked on? And can you explain why you did what you did, why you chose one technology over another technology? Is there something unique or complex going on in the code? Tell us about it. After all, we're software engineers, not mind readers. So don't expect us to just know whatever it is you'd like us to find out or notice. When you show up to the interview, it's safe to assume that there's a good chance that we may not have even looked at your portfolio or code samples. And even if we did, we may not have looked that closely because we're all really busy. So if we forget to bring it up, don't be shy. You wanna put your best foot forward 
and show us your portfolio. So bring your own laptop or an iPad and have your portfolio ready to go. Number six, play to your strengths. Don't overly focus on your weak areas and don't apologize for not knowing something. If you're stumped on something, there are a couple ways to approach this. First, if you flat out don't know anything about it, just acknowledge that you don't know or remember the answer and let us know that you'll definitely look into it later and just let this roll off. Don't let it jar your confidence. It's not game over unless you clam up. Second, if you happen to get stuck on a part of a problem, but you remember the rest of it, don't just shrug and give up. And now pay attention here. This is a super skill that most people don't do. Acknowledge that you don't quite remember this step, but then explain everything else that you do know and what you would do next and what you would do to find the missing pieces. If you just give up, we are left to assume the worst about you. This is the exact thing that happened to me during the interview that landed me my first dev job. I was totally stumped on some syntax pretty early on into solving a problem. So I set down the marker and I verbally explained everything else I could think of that was related to that topic. This ended up turning into a conversation that went about 30 minutes over the set time for the interview. Several years later in the interview, we handed a MacBook to an experienced software engineer to do some coding, but he was used to Windows. He kept struggling because if you push too hard on the trackpad, it pops up the dictionary and interrupts typing. Instead of being frustrated, he ended up laughing and stopped typing and then just started explaining things. I'm really glad we ended up hiring him because he ended up becoming one of my favorite software developers. Another way to play to your strengths is to pretend that you are a politician and look for natural ways to steer the conversation to topics that you do know. Without knowing much about you, we have to just take a stab in the dark a lot of times. We probably bring up a bunch of different generic questions and topics to try and figure out what your strengths and weaknesses are. So help us out, be proactive in sharing what you do know. And this goes beyond just code. Do you have additional insights? Do you have experience making business decisions where you had to balance out doing something perfectly against delivering the most return on investment for a business? Let us know about it. Seven, treat the interview like a conversation. If we ask you to do a code problem, don't just jump the gun and start answering before we've even finished talking or start working through things in your head while we're still trying to explain things. Instead, focus on understanding what we're saying and then ask us as many follow-up questions as needed until you know exactly what we want and then start solving the problem. And this is crucial. In asking questions, you'll find out if we're okay with you using libraries or you'll learn about different edge cases that you might need to consider. And basically you're demonstrating that you're the type of software developer who's going to take the time to really think through a problem first and then write code rather than having to rewrite the same code multiple times or worse, miss a really important edge case. Now you're gonna feel pressure to answer quickly because it is an interview, but you need to push back against that self-imposed pressure. The silence in the room will definitely be awkward for you while you're thinking about things but it will be worth it. And if anyone does give you a hard time for it, then congrats, you figured out that that's a place that probably has some dev culture issues that you probably don't wanna work at. Eight, did you spend too much time on leak code instead of building a portfolio? Now, this is kind of a tricky one to balance. Spending a lot of time on leak code can definitely help you develop problem solving skills that can help you with technical interview questions that you will eventually encounter. But this does not mean that you're actually going to become good at building applications. And what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is building applications. And for me personally, I would much rather hire someone who can demonstrate that they can build apps over someone who has memorized solutions to a ton of different leak code questions. But admittedly, software development interviews are kind of messed up in a lot of ways. A lot of what you encounter comes down to the people doing the interview. Even teams at the same company will often do things differently. For example, is the interviewer more interested in discussing everyday situations and code problems, or have they bought into the cracking the code interview book paradigm? I think the low level algorithm approach to interviews is often flawed because most of us just don't do this on a regular basis. And besides, typically the programming languages that we are using have built-in utilities to solve a lot of this stuff or else we will use third-party libraries. And in the case where we actually have to come up with an algorithm on our own, we have plenty of time to think through it, to whiteboard and plan and prepare and then write the code without the pressure of someone just looking over our shoulder so that they can see if we're gonna do it exactly the way that they want in a super short amount of time when they've had plenty of time to really refine and tweak the problem over the course of several interviews. And yet it's just thrown at you without any advance notice. And you're supposed to see things the way that they do. It just doesn't make tons of sense. That said, this is one of the competitive advantages that lead code experts and recent college graduates 
have who have memorized some of the stuff for quizzes. But even CS grads usually forget a lot of the stuff and have to brush up on it when they're going to go into a tech interview that is likely to be asking these type of algorithm questions. And trust me, I know plenty of senior software engineers who've been rejected for a job because they stumbled on an algorithm problem that they haven't even thought about or considered for the last 20 years. But sooner or later, you are going to encounter these kind of interviews and you're gonna win some and you're gonna lose some, so don't take it personal. I've even received lots of job offers and I've lost some because I didn't quickly solve an algorithm question that had nothing to do with anything that I have ever worked on. Then to make things even more confusing, there are a bunch of ways to do algorithm tests. You might end up having to write it out on a whiteboard and this can really suck because you can run out of space. I mean, outside of interviews, I rarely write code syntax on whiteboards. Most of the time, if I'm using a whiteboard, it's because I'm just mapping out the relationship between different things and, and jotting down some concepts and working through some of the logic, but I don't actually write code on the whiteboard. I write it in a code editor because that's what makes sense. Or they could hand you a laptop to solve a problem on. What if it's not that operating system or code editor that you're used to working on? Or they send you one of several different online assessments. Now you have to kind of figure out how to actually use the testing software in addition to solving the problem all in a short period of time. Just don't flip and give up because the difference between a good interview and a bad interview is just a matter of the stars lining up right. There are things that you can do to prepare and then there's just some luck that's involved because out of the thousands of different questions that someone could possibly ask you, does the interviewer happen to pick ones that actually align with your skills or do they pick something completely unrelated? And this leads into number nine. You need to come into this with the right mindset and expectations. Failing lots of interviews is not a good indication of your future as a software developer. So you need to learn from them and move on. I mean, in a few years, you're gonna look back and you're not even gonna care about all those interviews that you bombed because the only ones that are gonna matter are the ones that you actually accepted. Frankly, passing interviews is its own skill and even good software engineers are gonna bomb interviews so what you're experiencing is not something new, it's not unique to you, and sometimes it just comes down to simple math that there could be several really good candidates for a job and there's only one position. And the difference between you and the dev that actually gets the job might be super, super small. For example, at my last job, it was pretty much a draw between me and another software developer. And it was a recommendation from another employee that ultimately tipped the scale in my favor. Number 10, ask us thoughtful questions. Show some interest in our company and in our team. So ask us things that we like to do, what frameworks and tools the team likes to work with, maybe why we chose to work with React over Angular, ask questions about the company and don't be afraid to ask personal questions about us. You got to remember that an interview goes both ways. You should be trying to figure out if you even want to work with us. And also by asking questions, you're creating interpersonal connections, which can really help us to remember you when we're trying to look back over a bunch of different candidates that we've interviewed. And then it's also going to help you because you can take these insights and you can apply them to future interviews if this one doesn't work out. Number 11, don't get greedy with your first job and don't try to compare yourself to that self-taught Ivy League grad who ended up getting his first job at Google at Google Pay. And don't go around throwing some super high crazy salary out there because some dude on the internet did and happened to luck out and got it. For most of us, that first job is probably not going to pay that great or it's gonna be okay pay. But we just need to get into whatever job we can and start getting experience and then the higher pay will come faster than you think. Going from no code skills to my first dev job was really freaking hard. It was much harder than I anticipated. And when it came time to apply to jobs, I was beyond terrified and I felt completely unprepared to take the leap. I was developing more confidence in my ability to learn and figure things out, but that was not enough to overcome the pit in my stomach, the fear that I wasn't good enough and that no one would hire me. How do I prove I'm worth hiring? I mean, it made my stomach churn with anxiety just thinking about it. What if I couldn't make it? I would be stuck in construction forever. But maybe it's been easier for you. I'd love to hear your story. So if you share it in the comments, I will read it. Well, you can imagine the sigh of relief and excitement I felt when I got that first job offer, especially after going through the painfully challenging code interview. Woohoo, I was gonna be a software engineer. Hard part's over, right? Well, sort of. Sometimes I think we get so focused on learning to code or getting that first developer job that we kind of gloss over what we're actually signing up for. You see, as hard as that first step is, the harsh reality is that while some things will get easier, you'll also have other mountains to climb. And there's kind of three ways around this next mountain. The first way is working for a smaller company that isn't really tech focused. 
you may very well be on your own trying to just figure everything out with little guidance and high demands from a manager who swears you should be writing front end code using Lisp because his buddy used that to build air defense systems during Vietnam, which means this is gonna be a crash course in learning software development and patience. And as overwhelmed as you feel, you're gonna be forced to develop the skills through trial by fire. And if you survive this phase, you're gonna end up becoming an independent developer, but you might be like a leaky bucket full of best practices holes since you didn't really have someone more experienced to mentor you. Or you could end up working at a website mill, cranking out smaller but flawless marketing sites or apps for other businesses. You'll probably face a lot of pressure to deliver fast, pixel-perfect web pages, and you'll get really good at CSS and animations, but your JavaScript skills might not be that great depending on the kind of repetitive work you're doing. A third path is through the enterprise application world. You show up for your first day on the job only to find out you're working on a JavaScript framework that you have never heard of. The application is huge and complex, so many different coding styles, you don't even know where to start. So why not start with smacking that like button? But that is only the start of your pain. There are so many different pieces to the system from data collection to processing to retrieving the data with a hundred steps in between. And you're surrounded by computer science grads who speak a completely foreign language and drop acronym after acronym. You feel like a complete idiot having to ask what everything means and you secretly wonder how long you have until they realize they hired a dud and send you out the door or worse, to learn PHP. Setting up your dev environment is a complete nightmare. The docs are outdated and no one even remembers exactly what they did to get it working. So they tell you you're on your own. Deploying the code is a beast with a bunch more tools that you've never heard of. And maybe, just maybe, one day you'll stop feeling like a fraud and an idiot. Doesn't matter which path you take, there is a universal truth that sooner or later, you will encounter that condescending, opinionated, Haskell jerk that takes pride in making you feel like a moron. That person who finds joy in making you look bad in front of everybody else or those snarky looks that you get from some of the other senior engineers. Just when you think you start to get the hang of it, you get handed a critical bug that has to be fixed yesterday. You pound your head into the keyboard until midnight. You're so going to be fired if you don't get this fixed soon. The next day you yearn for even the slightest bit of praise for your late night dedication only to find out in your tired haste, you introduced a bug that was worse than the first one because you're working in JavaScript. Day after day, you feel like a failure, a fraud, an imposter. You know you're getting faster at solving problems, but you don't feel worth the pay that you're receiving until one day a new dev joins the team and starts asking you questions and you actually have answers and he says, wow, you're good at this. You feel that first spark of validation that you are good at some things and your confidence starts to grow and you wonder if you really are worth it as a software developer. It's been a year or two and you have a choice to make. You're feeling comfortable with your current job, so you could stay and coast for a while, take the slower path to career growth, or you could jump ship preferably to a job that's going to challenge you and up your skills, allowing you to solve harder problems. So that's what you do, a new set of tools, different tech stack, you're doing everything differently. You realize that you were underpaid at your last job, but now you feel like a fraud for making so much more at this company. How long until they realize it and fire you? You shouldn't be feeling imposter syndrome, but you do. Around and around this vicious cycle, you get better and better, but there's always something to make you feel dumb, like you're not sure if you'll be able to pull it off the best talent rises with you. You started at the bottom, then became a big fish in a medium sized pond. And now you're this little fish lost in a sea of brilliant software engineers, all working on really complicated stuff at one of the bigger tech companies. You start to think that you're losing your mind because it's getting harder to remember things when really what you're trying to hold in your mind is way more complex than anything at your last job. You wonder if you should have coasted like some of your HTML buddies, taking things a little bit slower rather than driving yourself to the edge of technology to chase a higher salary. But it doesn't matter. You can't go back. The reward for your effort is a pair of golden handcuffs. Even if you wanted to, the past is not an option. Lifestyle creep has you stuck. And besides, why work the same number of hours for less pay? You start to realize that this whole self-taught devs versus computer science grads comparison doesn't matter because every successful software engineer 
is self-taught. It just never goes away. You got where you are because you are a self-taught programming masochist. You know you should really pace yourself, but there's something satisfying about completing that next piece of the puzzle. Then one day you look around and realize that most of your buddies have burned out, moved on, or gone into management. There you are, surrounded by a team of younger software engineers making all the mistakes you've already made, but they're fast, really fast, and they get things done. Maybe it's time. Either go into management or become that dev out of place, alone. You feel like a different kind of imposter. You're now wearing glasses because you don't see sharp, but you're still handcuffed, a cog in a giant machine that never rests, always hungry for more code. You look back at your accomplishments only to realize that most of it has been rewritten with the latest and greatest silver bullet. And you wonder if chasing the dream was really worth it. A thousand late nights completely forgotten and yet there's something about it that makes you still smile. So you create a video to share what you wish you knew when starting out to pay it forward to the next wave of self-taught programmers. Get your own thoughts. Here are five tips for finding development jobs when you're self-taught with no experience and no computer science degree. And I'm not gonna go into sending applications through sites like LinkedIn. You can try applying to lots of companies through those sites, but it's so easy that everyone is doing it and it's just gonna be really hard to stand out when you're a new developer. It's probably not gonna to hurt to send some of those out here and there, but if you're relying on that as your sole strategy, then don't complain if you end up not getting a job. So let's jump into it. Number five, probably one of the easiest places to get started is with websites like Glassdoor and Indeed, the ones where employees can leave their experiences working at a company. Now, some of these also let you apply directly for jobs and will also suggest open listings to you. For right now, just ignore all of that. What you wanna do on these sites is look for smaller companies that are not posting listings on the big job sites. Often these companies hire through word of mouth or they may post listings on their own site and then when they're just not having any luck filling that position, then they consider paying to list on a bigger site. But because employees are able to leave their reviews, you will find out about companies that might not actually be posting any listings on Glassdoor. Similarly, you can look for smaller job boards and find listings that just aren't on these big sites. And there are tons of these boards out there. The one downside to job boards is that there's likely to be fewer listings and there might not be many that are actually local to where you live. But we're hoping to find our companies that are potentially hiring or that are getting ready to hire and try to connect with them before they actually post to the masses. And the only way to do that is with some effort. Now, once you've accumulated a list of companies, you should check to see if there are any actual job listings on their own websites. If there are, just keep in mind that it might be outdated. So I would not just apply and then sit back and hope to hear from them. Do a little bit of digging around on their website and on LinkedIn or wherever you can to try and find out who works there. And hopefully you can find out who the actual hiring manager is. So that way you can contact that person and follow up on the position. See if the job opening is even open and let them know that you're really interested and that you would love to show them your portfolio. Sometimes it can be really hard to find out who the hiring manager is. So have some copies of your resume and bring a way to showcase your portfolio and just walk into the company. At the front desk, ask them if there's somebody that you could talk to about that job listing or if there weren't any job listings that you're looking at in particular, Find out if there's somebody that you can talk to about software developer jobs and opportunities at the company. They might try to brush you off because either they don't know the answer or maybe they're unsure about giving that information or they might just end up pointing you to wherever it is that they post their listings. Even if they do this as a last ditch effort, you might try something like, hey, thanks, I totally appreciate that and I'm really interested in working for your company and I would really like to be able to talk to someone about what it is you are looking for in software developers. Maybe someone who could answer some of my technical questions. Is there a manager or maybe a software engineer that I could talk to for a couple minutes while I'm here? If you get lucky, be sure to have some questions ready so that you can stir up a conversation. Don't make this just about you. You really wanna show interest in the other person and in the company and have an actual genuine conversation. Let that person know you are really interested in working for the company and ask them who would be a good person to talk to about possible jobs. Often they're gonna be more in the know than the front desk. And so if they share that, then the next step is getting in touch with that hiring manager. They may have a company policy against giving out this information. And if that's the case, then ask if that person would be willing to pass on your resume to the hiring manager 
which is why you want to have a printed copy of your resume ready to go. The key is to get your resume into the hands of a non-HR person. You just don't want to getting stuck in a database or getting sifted out by HR. And persistence and just being an all-around cool person to chat with can go a long way to getting some attention and hopefully a phone interview. And this is why you should focus on local companies. It's just so much easier to walk in if you live nearby. Number four, Often these companies are renting office space and buildings shared by other smaller tech companies. So on your way out, be sure to write down the names of other companies in that building so that you can do some research later. Sometimes these tech buildings are part of a larger group of buildings. Be sure to walk into the lobby of each one and write down the companies. And then if you see a cluster of shiny looking tech companies on your way home, don't forget to stop by and collect more company names. You might find that some of these companies just aren't on Glassdoor or on Indeed, which means that there's gonna be less competition for jobs. And as a bonus, these companies are close, so you could end up with a really short commute. Go through all these companies and make a list of the most promising ones and then start that walk-in process. You're probably gonna strike out on a bunch of these, but all it takes is one. And be ready because you might get pulled into kind of an impromptu interview situation. So be ready for that. Number three, local recruiters. My first breakout job in the industry actually came through a recruiter. But before I get into the pros and cons of recruiters, I wanna give you a strong warning. Some recruiters should be avoided at all costs. Once you have a LinkedIn profile set up for software development, you will be approached by a ton of bottom feeder recruiters. And some of these are just scammers trying to get your personal information. Like they might have you fill out fake applications to get your name, your address, your birth date, your social security number. Just don't give that stuff out. With legitimate recruiters, all they really need is your resume, cover letter, and a link to your portfolio. And if you're new, they might ask you to take some sort of online assessment that they can forward to hiring managers. I had to take an online HTML, CSS, and JavaScript assessment to help gauge my skill level. The recruiters will then forward that information to a hiring manager who will look over it and decide whether to interview you. And eventually down the road at some point, they'll have you fill out an application. Just be weary of giving out application information to anyone up front. I also ignore recruiters who are impressed by my extensive experience and fill in the blank some random programming language that I've never used before, never listed on my LinkedIn profile profile. Or I've even been contacted by one recruiter who told me he was super impressed by my vast experience working at Adobe. The dude sent this to me like three weeks after I started there. I wouldn't personally call that a vast amount of experience at that time. These people aren't even looking at your profile. They're just blasting stuff out there to everybody, which means they aren't going to do a very good job of actually representing you. And the same goes for recruiters who contact you from other countries. What good connections could they possibly have in your country with companies near where you live. For example, I was recently contacted by a recruiter from the Philippines. Now there's nothing wrong with the Philippines per se, but why would I leave a great local company to go work for someone on the other side of the world in a different time zone for some random company that may not even pay well and may not have a good work-life balance? It just makes no sense. Good recruiters will have lots of connections with actual hiring managers at local companies. And they're often gonna work with both sides to help you present your best and most appropriate skills that fit the needs of the company and then help the hiring manager to tweak the job listing so that they can help get that past the HR bureaucracy if they want to hire you. Often they know about jobs before they even hit the market and they're super eager to really be aggressive in helping push you into getting a job because they want to get that big fat commission. Now there are some downsides to working with recruiters that I talk about in another video. But when first starting out and trying to get that first job, I definitely think that the pros outweigh the cons. So where do you find good local recruiters? Ones that actually are proactive with local connections. The same place that you find out about other local companies that are hiring. So let's talk about those. Number two, when I was starting out, I learned a ton of stuff about software development, including companies that were hiring devs at local meetups and JavaScript conferences. I would attend Angular, JavaScript, and React meetups through meetup.com. These were cool once a month hangouts with other devs in the area. Usually one or two people would present on different software development topics. And then there's usually pizza and then chatting afterwards. And after nearly every single presentation, the presenter would be like, oh, and by the way, I work for some company and we're hiring. So get in touch if you're looking for a job. Most times there was also a recruiter or two hanging out, chatting with folks and handing out their business card. 
And these recruiters seem like the ones that were most active in the local community. So this is where I would start if I was trying to make connections with a recruiter. It was also at these meetups that I found out about a local JavaScript conference that was held once a year and was affordable, unlike all the big name conferences. It was also a great place to meet other devs and recruiters. And this was sponsored by local companies who usually had booths set out where you could go chat to them about their company and about job openings. And the number one absolute best way to find good jobs is through personal connections. And many jobs are even filled before the listings even hit those big websites. But if you're new, how do you even leverage connections like that? First of all, the earlier you start building connections, the better. You don't want to be a user. I personally don't like recommending people for jobs if I feel like they're just trying to use me. My best recommendations go to people that I know and that I would actually personally like to work with. This isn't something you can really fake because these quality connections take time to build and require that you be a genuine friend and all around good person. So don't just show up at meetups and then expect that everyone is just going to help you get a job right away. That's just a recipe for failure. Try to make actual friends and play the long game. You see, there's a good chance that your first job won't even come from someone that you met at a meetup, but down the road, something might come your way. Maybe an opportunity for your second or your third job. I've had people I first met several years ago at a meetup who've reached out to me and asked if I was interested in joining their team. You see, we had had several good chats and interactions over the years. It's just that when I was new, I didn't really have the exact skills that they were needing. It just wasn't the right time. But once I had more experience, I was more likely to have the skills they were looking for and I would be a good culture fit. And that never would have happened if I had just sat back at those meetups and not actually gone out of my way and tried to meet people and chat with people and get to know them on a more personal level. Yes, it's super uncomfortable to go out of your way and meet new people, but it can totally be worth it. I mean, it was uncomfortable for me, but I still really enjoy bumping into like all those people that I've met at those early meetups. And while it's important to think about the now, don't forget to plant the seeds for something that's going to happen in the future. But now is probably what you're most interested in. And the next best place to leverage your connections is through your current circle. There's a good chance that there's someone in your extended family or maybe your friends group or a group of acquaintances through clubs or maybe church congregations that there's someone out there who is a software engineer and you don't even know it. Or maybe you know that they're a software engineer but they don't even know that you're trying to become one. So just speak up and let people know that you're looking. Maybe a brother-in-law has another brother-in-law that is looking for affordable software developers, so they decide to give you a chance. True story, that just happened to a bootcamp grad that I personally know. Connections completely trump every other way of finding a job. I found out about my last two jobs through connections that gave me a heads up on job openings. But my ultimate all-time favorite way to leverage connections is to start with the company you are currently working for. Now this is not going to work for everybody, but if you do work for a company that could use some help with either like updating their website or maybe they could use some smaller informational websites to help with marketing some products or they send out tons of emails that look like they came from the 90s you could offer to help them out you really got to demonstrate what you offer first otherwise they're probably just going to say no so maybe create some sample html emails that really look nice or some mock-ups for enhancing the website or maybe you just full-on just build a small marketing style website from the ground up then you present that to them with your idea of how you can contribute maybe part-time just to get started. Maybe they let you spend 10% of your time at first, but this can grow over time. And that's how I got my initial experience and I worked my way into more and more software development duties. Even if they say no, if you have built that marketing website, volunteer to let them have it and help them set it up so that it's getting used and congrats, you have a little bit of experience building something for an actual company. If that's just not an option and not going to work for you at your current job and you're willing to leave and take another position somewhere else, maybe one that's not even full-time doing software development, you know, maybe look for like a nonprofit that could use some help on their website or mailing list. And then even if it's only 25% of your job duties are tied into software development, that's still experience that you are getting as you work on finding that full-time gig. That could be okay for applying for conventional jobs, but I would tell my younger self to take more risks here. Break away from the convention if needed. What do you put on a resume when you don't have any programming experience? That first resume is really hard, at least it was for me. I mean, I spent more time on that resume than on any other one throughout my career. 
And in this video, I'm gonna share what I did as well as we're gonna look at some other common scenarios and how to handle them. When I was trying to get my first programming job, that first draft of my resume sucked and the second one and the third one, and I don't even remember how many drafts I went through, but it was a lot. My number one problem was that I was so focused on coding skills that I developed tunnel vision and completely ignored a bunch of other super important skills. And I don't wanna bore you with everything that I did on that first one. So here are the things that I did on that final draft. I had a bunch of disconnected and random jobs and instead of focusing on listing out all of the normal skills for each role, I tried really, really hard to try to pull out everything that was even remotely relevant to software development or to the tech industry in general. For example, with my underwater construction job, instead of focusing on skills that would only make sense to a commercial diver, I focused on highlighting my problem solving skills, having to think outside of the box in very unique situations, along with leadership experience. I once had a sales position at an online boat parts company. I could have focused on selling, but in between calls, I was also responsible for leading an effort to add product information and descriptions and stuff like that for thousands of new products on the website. You know, upload a picture and there was a form field for putting in the title and then another one for the description. On my resume, my focus for that position was content management and team leadership. I had totally forgot about it, but as I started down the path of content creation and trying to figure out how that tied into everything, something clicked. As trivial as it is, when I was formatting those lists in that text box, I had to use HTML ordered and unordered lists. You better believe that I noted that and it was something completely related, but I didn't even know it back then when I was doing it. When I was filling in those descriptions, I was like, this is a really weird way to format stuff, but okay, whatever. College for one semester, I worked as a pre-law peer advisor. I helped answer questions for students who were interested in going to law school and pointed them to helpful resources. But instead of focusing on that, I emphasized that I managed a distribution of a newsletter to thousands of students. You know, more content creation stuff. I regularly updated the pre-law website content and I organized monthly lectures. My reasoning for focusing on content creation was that I figured that a lot of potential employers would be looking for programmers to support content management systems and it would be somewhat related to the goals of those companies. I also worked at another company where I was doing digital preservation of the like, genealogy records, as well as scanning documents for other companies and government organizations. I could have just given some bland description of how I just scanned things day in and day out, but instead I focused on my ability to learn new technologies quickly, and that because of that, I was trusted to figure out how to use some of our more specialized machines and then go and train other employees on their use. And some of these were very expensive machines that could cost like over $100,000. Even though this didn't involve writing code, I knew that good programmers had to figure things out, had to configure systems, and then had to be able to mentor and communicate that to others. Being a new self-taught programmer, I was super limited on actual coding experience. So I had to focus really hard on selling my potential. I had to demonstrate that I had the right aptitude and mindset to become successful in order to encourage a potential employer to just take a risk on me. So that's great and all, but what if I didn't have much to say on my resume or I just hadn't worked at many companies and my resume was feeling really empty? That could be really intimidating and it was for me. There was this time when I felt that I had to write my resume according to some set of HR best practices. I mean, we had spent weeks learning the do's and don'ts at one of my college classes. That could be okay for applying for conventional jobs, but I would tell my younger self to take more risks here, break away from the convention if needed. Let's say I had worked two jobs, one flipping burgers and another as a cashier at a grocery store, and I just didn't think there was much to say that would even relate to the tech industry. In a situation like that, I would try to keep my resume professional by using good grammar and that kind of stuff, but I would probably break the rules of normal, traditional resume structure. Instead of filling up lines of text underneath each of those positions that have absolutely nothing to do with text, I would have a job history section and I put it at the bottom of the resume with the company name, the job title, probably a date range or how long I had worked there. And that's it, a two liner section. The top of the resume is the most important because it's what you see first and that's where I would put a relevant experience section. And this would focus 100% on my portfolio projects. For each project, I would have a header with the title of the project and then underneath it, I would have information about, you know, what are the problems that this application solved? What are the tools, the frameworks that I use to build it? 
how many people are using it if that's available and other information to convey that I have relevant skills. And I would order them with the most significant projects at top, especially those that are commercial in nature and that would best relate to the job listing that I'm applying for and the less relevant ones I would put towards the bottom of the list. The goal here is to focus on what I can do rather than on unrelated stuff that I have done. And this might ruffle some of the HR purist folks feathers, but who cares? I likely wouldn't be impressing those kind of people anyways. I'm really hoping for the ones that are technical enough to know what I did and why I did it and that can see my potential. And a lot of people, they just skim the resumes really quickly in order to filter people out or the companies are going to run your resume through some software that looks for matches of keywords against the job description. So by focusing on the stuff that I can do heavily, that's going to position me better in those search results. In HR, they're most likely gonna get that other job history stuff anyways, because they'll probably have me fill out an application where you have to specifically enter the company and when you worked and information about it. So they can get that later if they want. But my resume is going to be more of a marketing piece that complements my portfolio. And then I would be sure to have a really clear link to that portfolio in the resume. A lot of folks have asked me about the front end projects that I did that got me hired. So let's talk about those, but more importantly, why I chose them. Now, if you intend to just watch this video to the end and walk away with a plan to just copy what I did so that you can get a web development job, then you've totally missed the point. Instead, focus more on the progression of things and the why, and then apply that to your own situation and interests. Hopefully this helps you come up with your own ideas for a web development portfolio, so let's get started. My very first project was a simple HTML web page, no JavaScript, and that's because I hadn't started learning JavaScript. It was meant to be a silly page that was kind of a joke, for example. It had a menu bar, and if you moused over any of the buttons in the navigation, the other buttons would shift apart so that you couldn't actually click on anything and stuff like that. My goals for the site were to learn to structure a basic page with the headers, basic navigation, a sidebar, content, and footers, and to learn some basic CSS, as well as have some fun along the way. Keeping it simple enough that I could complete it quickly, it was never my intention to turn that into anything serious. I then started reading a book on JavaScript, and once I got a little ways in, I decided I wanted to apply some of the concepts that I was learning. So I was trying to figure out a simple problem that I could work to solve with JavaScript. And it just so happens that I was in a conversation with someone and they asked me how old I was and I had a complete brain fart. I was off by a year. So I decided to make an age calculator that accepted a birth date and then returned your age. My goal here was to learn how to use forms and some basic JavaScript to do the calculation and then update the DOM on a button click. The page itself was super simple. It's basically a blank page with a little widget in the center. And I tried to use some CSS that I just learned so that I could make the borders round on the corners and things like that. And I was introduced to handling different scenarios or use cases in JavaScript because the calculation had to be different depending on whether the birth date occurred before or after the current day. Well, that was fun, but what else could I do? I decided to use the same basic widget structure and then make a countdown timer because I just read about set timeout and set interval and I wanted to do something with those. Now, up to this point, the projects were really pretty simple and trivial, but they let me apply what I was learning and then that way I could get some quick successes that helped me to stay excited and motivated. My next project was a little bit more involved. One of the JavaScript books that I was reading talked about making a battleship game. And about the same time that I finished reading this section, my church announced a code challenge contest where they encouraged you to build some app or some game based on a gospel topic in a short amount of time. Challenge accepted. I took some of the concepts I had learned from that battleship lesson and adapted it to a simple game I called Cricket Cruncher that I thought might be fun for my kids. The basic concept was that there was a farm field with a bunch of different crops in it and there were crickets randomly hidden throughout the field. You would pick a vegetable and if it was hiding a cricket, you would be asked a gospel related question. If you answered incorrectly, the cricket would hop off and escape. But if you answered it correctly, a seagull would fly down and crunch it in its beak, a nod to pioneer history in Utah. This ended up requiring a lot more effort than I originally thought and I barely finished in time by the deadline. My kids liked it, but it couldn't really compete with a lot of the other submissions. My goal for this project was to incorporate concepts of prototypal inheritance, learn how to work with sprite images, and get some experience with CSS animations. I hope you're seeing the pattern here. I'm focusing on applying what I learned to something without just copying someone else's code. 
By this point, I'm also thinking about building a portfolio of projects that showcases a variety of concepts. And if this is helpful, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. Thanks. At this stage, I was diving into deeper concepts in HTML, like semantic HTML and different kinds of things that you could do with the DOM, like including audio. And one of my hobbies happened to be metal detecting. And I had tried out a metal detector called the Technetics Eurotech Pro. I thought it might be cool to create a simulator for this particular metal detector. I grabbed one of the marketing images from the manufacturer's website to use as a background. And then I dissected that image into a bunch of smaller sections and Photoshopped different versions of the sections to represent different states of the metal detector. On the HTML page I was building, I positioned transparent buttons over the background image buttons and used JavaScript to make the metal detector interactive so that you could click through the different settings and menu options. I then used a handheld recorder to record the actual sounds of the real metal detector and then cut that up into smaller audio clips so that I could trigger audio that matched the different interactions of the metal detector. And I was super excited about this. Picking projects like this that really excited me just helped keep me motivated. Each project could grow bigger and a little bit bigger in complexity without me getting super stuck since I kept building off of the stuff that I had just learned. Now it's time to get a little more strategic with my portfolio. That age calculator and the timer, they're somewhat run of the mill and not that impressive. My other stuff was more unique and tied into my interests and hobbies but that alone wouldn't likely sell a future employer on me as a potential hire. And from this point on, I'm not gonna be sharing pictures of the projects we'll be talking about because that's stuff that is owned by actual companies and I have not asked them permission to include the screenshots here. But that shouldn't really matter since the value is in the concepts. You see, at this point, I started looking for projects that could help my employer in the construction industry. I built a handful of niche information microsites, which are smaller websites, maybe like five to 10 pages of articles that could be used for marketing or as landing pages for ad campaigns. I designed the look and feel of each page, including the banners and the graphics and building these small sites allowed me to to learn how to do navigation and I was also able to learn how to have reusable sections with PHP includes even though these are still simple static websites. My goal is to build things with commercial intent build things similar to what real companies were paying to have built. Sure, these were far from the complexities of a commerce site, but it was a starting point for relevant job interview discussions. Best of all, the efforts paid off since my microsites landed a big project, which led to me doing a lot more stuff related to web development and computers for the company. I kind of created my own position where I could start getting some relevant experience. Around this time, I started attending local JavaScript meetups and I learned about single page applications. They sounded really cool. So then I started attending Angular JS meetups after hearing some relatives talking about Angular. It was apparent that this was in hot demand and companies wanted devs with Angular experience instead of Backbone and jQuery and some of that other stuff I had heard about. I decided to ride that trend and jumped into some of the old school Angular JS because I wanted to build something helpful that was way better than my static websites, something that could could really showcase what I could do. It took some thinking, but I decided that I was gonna build a contact management application for my employer at the time, because one of the problems was that when people would call in and leave messages, they were recorded on those little paper message slips that you'd write on and tear it off and hand to whoever had received that call and they would just get lost. If the boss asked for a phone number for someone who had called a few months back, it may or may not be found. So I started off with building a simple application. There was just a table with a list of contacts with their name, their company, phone number, and some notes about the call. You could press a button and you're prompted to add a new contact. You could also remove a contact from the table. And I hooked this up to Firebase so that that would handle the back end for me. Now, I tried to think of some other features that would be both useful for this company as well as have some appeal to future employers. I integrated the application with a tool called Twilio so that on a click of a button, the contact information was sent off to the boss's phone. And then I worked on adding additional features, including a field for how we were contacted. And then from there, I was able to add in some analytical charts so that you could see where most of the calls were coming from and, and get some other useful insights. And this worked out really well. I was then put over updating the company's main website and adding a blog for the company. And then I took all all that stuff that I had been building and I put it together in a portfolio site that I built using AngularJS to showcase the projects with descriptions of the different concepts that were involved with those projects. 
And then I even included some of the better design pieces that I had done for some of those micro sites. I'll talk about how this portfolio evolved in a second, but my first official software development job offer came because of these projects that I just talked about. And the most impactful projects were the contact management application, the blog, and those microsites. I brought an iPad to the interview and I was able to show the different projects that I worked about and talk about the different aspects of web development. I could demonstrate this visually because my portfolio showed that I had done something with all of the core concepts of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The company was looking for Angular experience and even had a one hour section of the interview dedicated to Angular and writing on that Angular JS trend really helped me to land that job. Now, after this first job, I revised my personal web development portfolio and shifted to something that was more visual with lots of thumbnails of stuff that I had worked on, including this first enterprise job. A quick word of caution here, some companies aren't going to want you to share screenshots of your projects, so be respectful to that. I try to follow fair use principles and include only smaller partial screenshots rather than showing the entire app designs. It's also super, super important not to share private company information or customer data. For any of the screenshots, I would first edit the page to use names like fake person one or John Doe and fake email one and phone numbers that were just all zeros to make it very clear that it was all fake data. Don't share real data or sensitive parts of applications. Okay, when it came time to apply for my next job, I put all that new work I had just done front and center, followed up by the commercial stuff from my previous employer, and then I backburnered the metal detector app and the game. I dropped the timer and age widgets completely because they were just trivial in nature and the project seemed to distract more than help my messaging at this point. Eventually, I had enough examples of professional stuff that I let that old stuff go and removed even the related code from GitHub hub because it just no longer represented what I could do. Let's face it, the early code just is not that great when you go back and look at it, and there's no need to hang on to it as you get better.